who set my man i the stocks, I set him there, sir, but his own disorders deserve much less advancement. Lear. The baron was inflexible in his resolution not to let Matilda leave the castle. The letter, which announced to her the approaching fate of young Gamwell, filled her with grief, and increased the irksomeness of a privation which already preyed sufficiently on her spirits, and began to undermine her health. She had no longer the consolation of the society of her old friend Father Michael, the little fat friar of Ruby Gill was substituted as the castle confessor, not without some misgivings in his ghostly bosom, but he was more allured by the sweet savour of the good things of this world at Arlingford Castle, than deterred by his awe of the Lady Matilda, which nevertheless was so excessive, from his recollection of the twang of the bowstring, that he never ventured to find her in the wrong, much. Lest to enjoin anything in the shape of penance, as was the occasional practice of holy confessors, with or without cause, for the sake of pious discipline, and what was in those days called social order, namely, the preservation of the privileges of the few who happened to have any, at the expense of the swinish multitude who happened to have none, except that of working and being shotted for the benefit of their betters, which is obviously not the meaning of social order in our more enlightened times, let us therefore be grateful to Providence, and sing Te Deum Laudamus in chorus with the Holy Alliance. The little friar, however, though he found the lady spotless, found the butler a great sinner, at least so it was conjectured, from the length of time he always took to confess him in the buttery. Matilda became every day more pale and dejected, her spirit, which could have contended against any strenuous affliction, pined in the monotonous inaction to which she was condemned. While she could freely range the forest with her lover in the morning, she had been content to return to her father's castle in the evening, thus preserving underranged the balance of her duties, habits, and affections, not without a hope that the repeal of her lover's outlawry might be eventually obtained, by a judicious distribution of some of his forest spoils among the holy fathers and saints that were to be, pious proficients in the ecclesiastic art equestrian, who rode the conscience of King Henry with double curb bridles, and kept it well in hand when it showed metal and seemed inclined to rear and plunge. But the affair at Gamwell Feast threw many additional difficulties in the way of the accomplishment of this hope, and very shortly afterwards King Henry II went to make up in the next world his quarrel with Thomas a Becket, and Richard Cur de Lyon made all England resound with preparations for the crusade, to the great delight of many zealous adventurers, who eagerly flocked under his banner in the hope of enriching themselves with Saracen spoil, which they called fighting the battles of God. Richard, who was not remarkably scrupulous in his financial operations, was not likely to overlook the lands and castle of Loxley, which he appropriated immediately to his own purposes, and sold to the highest bidder. Now, as the repeal of the outlawry would involve the restitution of the estates to the rightful owner, it was obvious that it could never be expected from that most legitimate and most Christian king, Richard I of England, the arch-crusader and anti-Jacobin by excellence, the very type, flower, cream, pink, symbol, and mirror of all the holy alliances that have ever existed on earth, excepting that he seasoned his superstition and love of conquest with a certain condiment of romantic generosity and chivalrous self-devotion, with which his imitators in all other points have found it convenient to dispense. To give freely to one man what he had taken forcibly from another, was generosity of which he was very capable, but to restore what he had taken to the man from whom he had taken it, was something that wore too much of the cool physiognomy of justice to be easily reconcilable to his kingly feelings. He had, besides, not only sent all King Henry's saints about their business, or rather about their no business, their feigning and ties, but he had laid them under rigorous contribution for the purposes of his holy war, and having made them refund to the piety of the successor what they had extracted from the piety of the precursor, he compelled them, in addition, to give him their blessing for nothing. Matilda, therefore, from all these circumstances, felt little hope that her lover would be anything but an outlaw for life. The departure of King Richard from England was succeeded by the episcopal regency of the bishops of Ely and Durham. Longchamp, Bishop of Ely, proceeded to show his sense of Christian fellowship by arresting his brother bishop and despoiling him of his share in the government, and to set forth his humility and loving kindness in a retinue of nobles and knights who consumed in one night's entertainment some five years' revenue of their entertainer, and in a guard of fifteen hundred foreign soldiers 
whom he considered indispensable to the exercise of a vigor beyond the law in maintaining wholesome discipline. Over the refractory English. The ignorant impatience of the swinish multitude with these fruits of good living, brought forth by one of the meek who had inherited the earth, displayed itself in a general ferment, of which Prince John took advantage to make the experiment of getting possession of his brother's crown in his absence. He began by calling at reading a council of barons, whose aspect induced the holy bishop to disguise himself, some say as an old woman, which, in the twelfth century, perhaps might have been a disguise for a bishop, and make his escape beyond sea. Prince John followed up his advantage by obtaining possession of several strong posts, and among others of the castle of Nottingham. While John was conducting his operations at Nottingham, he rode at times past the castle of Arlingford. He stopped on one occasion to claim Lord Fitzwater's hospitality, and made most princely havoc among his venison and brawn. Now it is a matter of record among diverse great historians and learned clerks, that he was then and there grievously smitten by the charms of the lovely Matilda, and that a few days after he dispatched his travelling minstrel, or laureate, Harpeton, three, whom he retained at moderate wages, to keep a journal of his proceedings, and prove them all just and legitimate, to the castle of Arlingford, to make proposals to the lady. This Harpeton was a very useful person. He was always ready, not only to maintain the cause of his master with his pen, and to sing his eulogies to his harp, but to undertake at a moment's notice any kind of courtly employment, called dirty work by the profane, which the blessings of civil government, namely, his master's pleasure, and the interests of social order, namely, his own emolument, might require. In short, I L U D L employ Caserti's ne pamens, idichue la cor, o u taut as a paint en beau, on a pelite etri alami du prince, mace chue la ville, id certut en province, les gens grossiers o entinami macaro. Prince John was of opinion that the love of a prince actual and king expectant was in itself a sufficient honor to the daughter of a simple baron, and that the right divine or royalty would make it sufficiently holy without the right divine of the church. He was, therefore, graciously pleased to fall into an exceeding passion, when his confidential messenger returned from his embassy in piteous plight, having been, by the baron's order, first tossed in a blanket and set in the stocks to cool, and afterwards ducked in the moat and set again in the stocks to dry. John swore to revenge horribly this flagrant outrage on royal prerogative, and to obtain possession of the lady by force of arms, and accordingly collected a body of troops, and marched upon Arlingford Castle. A letter, conveyed as before on the point of a blunt arrow, announced his approach to Matilda, and Lord Fitzwater had just time to assemble his retainers, collect a hasty supply of provision, raise the drawbridge, and drop the portcullis, when the castle was surrounded by the enemy. The little fat friar, who during the confusion was asleep in the buttery, found himself, on awaking, enclosed in the besieged castle, and dolefully bewailed his evil chance. 